Hi, my name's Ian Harper, and I'm the author of the Cicerone Guidebook, Walking the Cape Roth Trail. Welcome to a new series of video guides to help you plan and prepare for an expedition on what's been described as Britain's toughest trail. In this episode, I'm going to cover getting to and from Cape Roth itself, as it's one of the aspects of the walk I get asked about the most. That's because the Cape is rather remote and also sits on a Ministry of Defence bombing range, so there are some considerations in accessing it and onward travel. The last stage of the journey to the Cape can feel one of the hardest. Beyond Sandwood Bay, it's a slog across beautiful but bleak, peat-dark rolling moors with the North Atlantic often throwing its worst at you. It's tough going at times and completely trackless, but the remoteness is intoxicating. So it's going to be a day you'll long remember, especially when the lighthouse finally peeks into view as you round that final hill. The Cape itself marks the angle where Viking ships altered course, veering south to enter the Minch on their way to the west coast of Scotland and the Hebrides. The Cape's name is derived from the Old Norse name for Cape Roth, Hvarf, which means turning point. Standing on Cape Roth, you are far above the waves on some of the highest cliffs in the UK. Some way to the east is Dunnet Head, which is the most northerly point of mainland Britain, not John O'Groats as is more commonly supposed. To the north, there's almost nothing between you and the North Pole, almost three and a half thousand kilometres away. The final section of land leading to the Cape itself is part of the Cape Roth Ministry of Defence live firing range. Because of this, you'll need to check in advance if any range activity is planned during your visit. Activity on the range is usually advertised well in advance, both on the MOD website and also in the media. You can also call range control directly for more information. In my experience, they're always very helpful. I'll leave all the numbers and the website links in the video description below for you. One thing to bear in mind is that mobile phone reception in the area is very patchy, so all telephone arrangements or inquiries should be made in advance. A barbed wire fence marks the southern range boundary and is encountered soon after you cross the Keysgeg River. Maybe I'm just clumsy, but I've managed to rip a nice pair of walking trousers on this fence, which was a bit of a wounder having survived 200 odd miles of trail, so take care. Red flags fly and warning notices are posted when the range is in active use. Sometimes red flags will be flying despite there being no active range activity. This is usually because there is a break in an exercise, so it's easier to leave the flags flying than travel all the way out to take them down. Here, range control can usually advise you when these breaks occur and where it may be safe to proceed despite the flags flying, although this will be at your own risk. I would absolutely not recommend proceeding when red flags are flying without first having spoken to range control as that's an excellent way to get blown up. Live, inert or expended ammunition may be found on the range, so if you do come across something suspicious, leave it well alone and contact range control with a grid reference and description on your return. At Cape Roth itself, there is the jagged beauty of the towering sea cliffs and of course the lighthouse itself, which you've probably imagined many times in your thoughts. The lighthouse was built in 1827 and can be seen from 40 kilometers away. There's a now silent foghorn, which once boomed mournfully into the North Atlantic to warn passing ships of the dangers lurking around the jagged sea cliffs. A couple of hardy entrepreneurs, John and Angela Ur, run the Ozone Cafe, which is open all year round. The cafe is named because of the ozone smell you can get when you're standing on top of the sea cliffs. And I can tell you it's a jolt of pure life-giving energy. When I first heard about the cafe, I thought it might have been a joke, but it's the real deal. And a warm cup of tea, soup, sandwiches and snacks can be had in the company of a large pack of Springer Spaniels. The cafe also provides basic overnight accommodation with a cooked breakfast. 
just call in advance if you're planning to stay. And again, I'll put all the numbers in the description below. If you're not staying in the accommodation at the cafe, the buildings at the Cape offer sheltered camping spots where you can retrace your steps to a pleasant spot by a nearby river. There is also the superbly located Kierweg Bothe, 10 kilometers or so to the east of the Cape. Cape Roth itself is inaccessible by direct road, so a bus and passenger ferry bring visitors from Keerdale, which is just outside Duness, to the Cape and provides a handy means of escape without the need to backtrack to Kinlochavie. The service runs from the beginning of May every day until the end of September, weather, wind, tides, demand and military operations permitting. The ferry service is operated by John Morrison and the bus service is operated by James Mather. Between the months of May and September, the first ferry leaves Keerdale at around 11 each day, including Sundays. The crossing takes about half an hour. There is usually an afternoon sailing leaving Keerdale between 1.30 and 2. Throughout June, July and August, the first ferry leaves at around 9.30 on weekdays and Saturdays, and services then run throughout the day on demand. On Sundays, throughout the season, the first ferry leaves at around 11, with the last return sailings in the late afternoon. At the time of recording this, adult single fares from the Cape Roth Lighthouse to Keerdale are around £15, and that's cash only, although if you are out of cash, lifts can be given to the nearest cash point for an extra fee, and that covers the ferry and minibus. But for all the latest prices and information, check out visitcaperoth.com, and again, I'll leave the link in the description. Outside the main season, there is no real alternative but to retrace your steps back to Kinlochavie. If you're really desperate to reach Duness, you could follow the 4x4 track east to the ferry crossing. It's about 11 miles and you could use Kaveg Bothy as a stopping point. From the point at which the ferry arrives at the Cape, you head inland around the Kyle of Duness, but this is very rough trackless ground, so I really can't recommend it. In terms of onward travel from Duness, a bus service leaves at around 5 past 8 from Monday to Saturday and also calls in at the post office in Kinlochavie around 8.55 before going onward to meet the Inverness train at Laeg. More information about this is available at thedunessbus.com. It's advisable to check this service locally as the time and location of departures can vary. In summer months, direct coach services to Inverness may also be available. Details of all these services should always be checked in advance. And once again, I'll put all of them in the links in the description below. So that's hopefully all the main information you'll need about Kate Roth, but I'll leave you with a short story from one of my early expeditions when I was writing the guidebook. At the time I had a really busy job, so the only time I could get away was over the Christmas and New Year period not known for great weather in this part of the world. On one particular trip, I was accompanied by Bob Smith. We were camped near Oikel Bridge when we saw the MWIS weather forecast for extreme cold and snow. We were just about to start one of the remotest sections over Ben Moore to Reconic and Kinlockaby and on to the Cape. The weather forecast wasn't wrong. We braved some pretty extreme conditions and it was really tough going. Nighttime temperatures dropped down to around minus 20 and on one night my boots froze solid. I was only able to put them on after cooking them on my stove for a few minutes. When we finally got to Sandwood Bay, the beach was frozen solid right the way down to the waterline. That's not something I've ever experienced before. Fortunately at Strathalish Bothy, there was a prodigious amount of peat, so we were able to burn that and warm up a bit. Although we hadn't planned it, we ended up arriving at the Cape on Christmas Day itself. We got a warm welcome from John and his dogs, only to discover that his wife had been stranded in Duness after going to get the Christmas turkey. It was only much later that I found out that this episode had actually made the national newspapers and Bob and I got a very peripheral mention as the crazy walkers that arrive unannounced through the teeth of one of the coldest winters in memory. Put it this way, I doubt it's an experience any of us is going to forget. So thanks a lot for watching and please subscribe to the channel and leave a like and also let us know in the comments if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes. If you head over to caperothtrail.org you'll find all the information that you need to start planning an expedition there for free as well as a new shop so if you fancy a t-shirt or a mug like this you can get one there and it all helps towards the upkeep of the website. So thanks again for watching and I'll catch you soon.